week, our Wednesday night services consist of the format of we, are, we will preach through a specific book, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We're going to be going through the book of Malachi. So I want to stay in the Old Testament for a little while. There's a lot more material in the Old Testament than there is in the New Testament. So I wanted to do a few books. I also wanted to bounce around a little bit. So we did a book that's you know, uh, more towards the beginning of history. It's also in the section of history. When you look at the layout of your Bibles, they're actually categorized. A lot of people don't know that. So I wanted to pick something now in the Minor Prophets. And I love the book of Malachi. I feel like I have a pretty firm grasp on each individual chapter you know, uh, of the book of Malachi. There's a lot to be learned in this book, so I'm sure you guys will enjoy it. We're going to begin Malachi chapter number 1. Verse number 1, the Bible reads, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. So we see right here, not technically the author of the book, but we at least see the preacher or the prophet who is preaching this. The reason why I say that is oftentimes, even in the New Testament, does everyone remember what an, what an amanuensis is? I refer to that in the book of Romans. That's the person that actually pins something down. It comes from the word like a secretary. It's, it's a person that is being given information from someone else, that the words are not originating or they're not original to the person pinning them down. So here, as in most cases, Malachi is probably telling someone else, just like Jeremiah had for off. Just like we saw in the book of Romans, Paul had Tertius writing down the book of Romans. Here, Malachi is the one preaching. It doesn't give you the man's name, but it's very probable, if you will, with the pattern given in the Bible, that someone is writing this down. It begins with this also, the burden of the word of the Lord. Now, this is something that the Bible will talk about commonly, and a lot of people may not understand what this means, but a burden in this context, so, oh, well, the definition just in general of a burden is something that is heavy, of course, right? It's something that is usually not good. And that's what it means, the burden of the word of the Lord. It means something that's not good of the word of the Lord. It means that I'm getting ready to tell you about how I'm going to punish you most of the time. I'm getting ready to tell you about the problems that you guys have. I'm getting ready to, with these words, I'm getting ready to think about it this way, lay a burden upon your shoulders. Right? That's what it means. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel. And then he says, by Malachi. That's the preacher. Look at verse number two. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. So we get in verse two, three verses here, and we got a lot to look at. Number one, we can see that he's addressing Israel. He says, I love you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? So Israel is asking the question, wherein have you loved us? In what way have you loved us? And then he responds by proving his love. He says, was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? So he's just pointing out the fact that they were brothers, Esau and Jacob, right? Then he says this, Yet I love Jacob, and I hated Esau. Now, this is what he has done unto Esau. And laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Now, in just a moment, we're going to turn over to Romans chapter number 9. And we, I believe, cross-reference these passages when we preach through the book of Romans. Excuse me, KK. Michaela, give me a drink of water. Uh, I believe we cross-reference these passages which I believe that every Calvinist would cross-reference these passages, and their main go-to verse would be taken from them. Then they would finally understand what it means when the Bible says, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. Now, right here in verse number 3, you don't need to understand the full context of this at all. Just look at verse number 3, and it says this, And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Now he's talking obviously present tense right then at that moment. Esau. I want you to flip back real quick to Genesis chapter number 32 verse number 28. Now was Esau living at the time that Malachi pinned this book down or he had someone else pin this book down? No he was not. So he's not speaking to the person of Esau. He's rather speaking to the nation of Esau. Now the nation of Israel that is the, the, see, people think that Israel just means nation. No, it does not. That it's just a term that is isolated or independent or exclusive to referring to the nation of Israel. Israel is just as much a personal name of a person as Jacob is. 
The name Israel was the personal name of Jacob. It was changed from Jacob to Israel. Right here when he says Jacob, that is also a personal name. But guess what? Both of those names, Jacob and Israel, can double as referring to the nation. And they do all throughout the Bible. You know, here's an example. In Isaiah chapter 58, verse 1, he says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. And he says, And show my people their sins and the house of Jacob their transgressions. Who is he talking about when he says Jacob? He's talking about the nation of Israel, correct? I want you to look at uh, Genesis chapter number 32, verse number 28. Genesis chapter number 32, verse number 28. Let me get there myself. Genesis chapter number 32, verse number 28. This is where his name is actually changed. When he's wrestling with the man, verse number 28, and he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with Jacob and with men, and with men, and hast prevailed. I want you to also turn over to, let's go ahead and look at this as well at the same time. Genesis chapter number 36, verse number 1, while we're right here. Genesis chapter number 36, verse number 1. Notice this. Now these are the generations of Esau. And then what does it say? who is Edom. So notice, what is used interchangeably here? Esau and Edom. Edom and Esau, these are the same things. They're, they are interchangeable. They are synonymous for one another. You can refer to the person as Esau. You can refer to the person as Edom. Most of the time, Edom refers to the nation, and Israel refers to the nation. Jacob in the Old Testament would normally be used when he's speaking of the person. But if you notice, there's a transition through the book of Genesis when he's dealing with Jacob. After he changes his name to Israel, he will then also at that point start speaking of him at, um, in the terms of being called Israel. Even in even the major prophets when he's preaching, most of the time, what does he refer to him as? Israel, but sometimes he'll throw in there, like I just quoted Isaiah 58.1, Jacob. So right here when it says, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, this is referring to a nation. And the proof of that is that he laid his mountains and his heritages and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Edom, at that time that Malachi was preaching this, God destroyed Edom. God destroyed, he says here, Esau, which he's referring to the nation of Edom, or the nation of Esau, his descendants. The nation that he founded, just like Israel had the 12 tribes that came from him, and they populated the nation, and the nation became known as Israel, or Jacob sometimes. This works the same with Edom and Esau. And he's saying that he destroyed the nation of Edom and Esau. He's not saying that he hates this individual person. And this is what Calvinists will teach. They'll teach that God just hates certain people. I want you to turn also to uh, uh, Genesis chapter 25. While we're here, I want you to go to Genesis chapter number 25. Genesis chapter number 25. This is a verse that they'll cross-reference. And we're going to go over to Romans chapter number 9 in just a moment. So I want you to, to focus hard on what we read here in Genesis 25. Take note of it. Keep it in your mind. And then we're going to cross-reference where two things we've looked at are actually quoted. Genesis 25, verse number 22. Look at verse number 22. It says, And the children struggled together within her, referring in, uh, to, into Rebe Rebecca, and the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it be so, if I'm supposed to have this child, she saying, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. So even when the two children were in her womb, what did God refer to Israel and, or Jacob? Whatever you want to refer to them as. Jacob and Esau. How did God look at them? What was the main purpose of these two? How when, when Jacob and Esau are both being discussed, even while in the womb... What was their purpose? Being a nation. They were discussed as being the fathers of a nation, even while in the womb. Well, I want you to keep this in mind here. Actually, you can even keep your hand there. Go over to Romans chapter number 9. I want you to flip over to Romans chapter number 9. Romans chapter number 9, because this is quoted, uh, a section of verses here in Romans chapter number 9 is taken out of context and twisted to mean something that it is not saying by Calvinists, those that believe in predestination. And when they say predestination, they mean something entirely different than what the Bible says when it says predestination. When they say predestination, they're saying that God chose who was going to go to heaven and who was going to go to hell. And they go to the point, if you actually speak to one, that will articulate his position, because they all try to back out of this. 
But if you actually speak to a Calvinist and you pin them down, they will admit to you that God decides while a baby is in the womb whether it will go to heaven or whether it will go to hell. And it has nothing to do with the decisions or the choices that it makes. That God has a sovereign will that cannot be overthrown. You know what you have? You have some sadistic freak of a God. And that's not the God of the Bible. You have a God that's maybe the devil. Maybe, maybe Calvinism is, is worshiping Satan, possibly. If you are literally believing that God decides that an innocent baby would just go to hell, or he's the one deciding, he chooses, I want your children all to go burn an eternity of hell. How does that make you feel? Think about your kids. Does that sound just? Does that sound like the God of the Bible? No, not a chance. Look at Romans chapter number 9. Look at Romans 9. Look what it says in verse 11. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. Now notice what it said right there. It was said unto her before the children were even born that the elder would serve the younger. Now number one, let me point this out. The elder in their own personal life never served the younger. But we find the answer in the very next verse. Look at what it says. As it is written. So you know what that means? I'm going to give you an example of this. Now let's see if this example is an example of a person or of a nation. Look at the very next verse. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Where's that quoted from? Malachi chapter number one. What's going on in Malachi chapter one? Are we discussing the persons? Jacob and Esau, how God hated the person of Esau, therefore he destroyed all of his land. Is that what we're talking about? No, we're talking about the nation of Esau. We're talking about the nation of Edom. And he actually tells you how the purpose of election might stand. He said he already decided this, and then he says, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. So he's given you an example of what he just said. He's given you an example of that actually being fulfilled. And when you go back and you look when they were in their womb, when God actually says, and we didn't finish reading that in verse number 23, but the end part of that verse is where that's quoted from. I'll read it to you in Genesis 25, I'm sorry, 25, 23. It says, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Notice that. When it says the elder shall serve the younger, right before that it says, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people. People. We're not talking about an individual person. And then when we look that verse up in the New Testament, when it quotes the Old Testament, he says, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Where's that quoted from? Malachi chapter number one. So there's your example of how he chose. And how did he choose? That one would go to hell and one would go to heaven? No. But rather he chose that he was going to use a individual nation. One individual nation and he destroyed the other nation. At this point, right? He destroyed Esau or Edom. Go back to uh, Malachi. Malachi chapter number one. Malachi chapter number one. <clears throat> notice what it says there. Verse number four, he says this, whereas Edom. So you notice what happened there? Just like I was saying previous to this, Esau and Edom are used interchangeable. Esau and Edom here are referring to the nation. They are not speaking of the person. So he says, whereas, whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished. Notice we. Notice that. Edom saith, we are impoverished. It's the people that, got, that are speaking here. We are impoverished. What does it mean to be impoverished? It means that you are made to be in poverty, right? Someone else puts you into poverty. Or you have been put into poverty. We are impoverished. But we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. And somebody, you know, notice that this could maybe be the next step of the Calvinists. They're like, okay, well I admit that personally he didn't choose but all those people in the nation, he just chose all of them. They could say that, right? They could try to at least attempt that. Well, maybe it's just the whole nation that he's just damning to hell. Well, notice that God is not an unjust God. Notice what he says in verse number four. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will, we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. Now watch this. And they shall call them the border of righteousness. Are they like trying to do that which is right and then God is just... 
damning them, and God's just stri you know he he uh, he stricken them with all different types of, of diseases and famines. Is that what he's doing? He's punishing them while they're doing that, which is right. No. Why does God hate them? Because their wickedness. God doesn't just hate them. Oh, I just I just hate you guys. Don't talk to me. I just hate you. Nobody doesn't matter what you do. And you just try to like, but God is like, no, oh, I hate you. Like, please, I want to be saved. I hate you. I mean, Matt, that's the God that they're putting in. That's the God that they're creating. Think about that. Yeah. There's nothing that one can do. There's nothing. God already decided for you. Calvinism is wicked. Right. I know when I preached on this in Romans 9, I ripped on Calvinism. That is not just, oh, you know, you know you're an independent fundamental Baptist. You have to preach against Calvinism. No, I preach against Calvinism because it's wicked. Amen. It's super evil. Amen. When you, you make God into like this sadistic monster where he's deciding who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Like he's playing some sort of board game or something. And nothing matters. Like he's just desensitized and doesn't have emotions, doesn't love or hate people in that sense. He's just like this robot who doesn't care about life. And he's just like, just flippantly, just like kicking people into hell. Oh, you go here, you go there. It doesn't matter. No, it does matter. Right. And that's what happens when you have a Calvinist going out soul winning. Some guy maybe that's been, that maybe did get saved, but he got deceived into portions of predestination doctrine. You know what that can cause them to do? That can cause them just to not think what they're doing matters. Mm -hmm. That can cause them just to think, oh, it doesn't really matter what I do, you know, People will get, if they believe, well, they were just predestined. If they, you know, if they don't believe, then they just weren't predestined. That's a lie. Amen. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth. Right. Why would Jesus say, go ye in all the world? What's the reason? Well, if they're just going to believe, they'll believe. It's stupid. It's not what the Bible teaches. Right. The, you know, literally, in the Old Testament, they offered a free will offering. What does that mean? They, out of their own volition chose whether or not they wanted to bring an offering. You choose. You want to bring an offering? There's no certain time. There's no certain offering. You know, you just bring a free will. He does say, it gives restrict, not restrictions, but stipulations on these are the types of offerings that I want you to offer as a free will offering, but it's up to you. That means God's saying, you have free will. You decide whether you want to bring this offering or not. Right. Another thing is, notice what he says. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I what? Hated. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. What, is, what did 90% of Christians, even, even independent Baptists, what do they say about God's personality? They love to quote one verse, and it's not this one. God is love. God is love. God, how many times have you heard Christians say, God loves everyone? God loves everyone. Are you kidding me? You have a verse here that literally says, think about this. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Number one, it couldn't be any clearer, number one. But number two, is he talking about a person? Or what is he talking about? Think about that. A whole nation of people. Literally, at this time, he hated this nation. He hated. Now, I'm sure there could be, he could just be making a general statement of that, that there may have been a righteous remnant there. But you know what he says? He looks at the nation of Edom and he says, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. He looks at an entire nation and says, I hate them. Why? Because of their wickedness. God is not unjust. God, God loves, but God also hates. And you know what he hates? He hates the wickedness. He hates the wicked or the unjust. Turn over to uh, Psalm chapter number 5. Psalm chapter number 5. <clears throat> For some reason, people have a hard time swallowing. They love to believe that God is love. They have no problem with that. But they just, it, you know, it's, it's, it's almost to them sinful when you say that God hates. They think that it is, they really think that it is a sin if, so, if you hate or if God, you know, and they'll tell you, you shouldn't hate. We need to be more like God. You shouldn't hate. As though God does not hate. There are people that we should hate. There are times to hate. There's a time to love. There's a time to hate. The Bible teaches that. Man. Let's look at another example where God says this. Look at Psalm chapter number 5. Look at verse number 5. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Notice what it says. Thou hatest 
all workers of iniquity. Notice who God hates here. Workers of iniquity. Notice who he hated in Malachi chapter number one. He hated Edom or Esau. And why? It says in the border of their wickedness. Because they're wicked. Because they're evil. There's a point where God will stop loving someone and God will hate you. You know why people don't like that? You know why people reject that? It's definitely not because they search the scriptures diligently. It's because it's an inconvenient truth to believe that God can hate. Because you know what the next question is? Well, does God hate me? It's scary to them. God, the people today, they want to they want to look at, they want to create a God in their own image. They want to make God to be out whoever they want him to be. They don't want to look in the Bible and see, hey, who is God? Who is the true God? They just want God to be who they want him to be. They want God to be like how they want him to be. And you know how they want him to be? He doesn't hate. You know what? So they can go out and live however they want. A lot of the people you'll speak to about this that are adamant, oh, God doesn't hate anyone. A lot of them are probably filthy people. That's why they believe that. A lot of them are probably wicked people. Who would not want to believe in, in a God that hates more than a person that is hated by that God? Right. And when you talk to a lot of people, who pushes this type of garbage the most? Like filthy sodomites. Right. Like pedophiles. And what type, of, what type of God do they say that they believe in? It's not the God of the Bible. It's a God that just loves everybody. He doesn't care what you do in your life. Well, that sounds pretty convenient, doesn't it? You have these filthy, disgusting sins in your life. Maybe not even a sodomite, some guy that's living in fornication. You try to point out, man, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. Hey, you shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be doing that. Oh, you shouldn't judge me, man. God's not a God of judging. God doesn't judge. You shouldn't judge, right? That's the kind. Why do they say these types of things? It's the same reasoning. Think about it. Because they don't want to be judged. They don't want a God that hates them. They don't want to feel convicted. They want a God that just allow. This is what it comes down to. They want to live in whatever type of lifestyle, whatever type of sin that they can, that they want to live in, and they want to be left alone. And they don't want their conscience bothering them. They just want to say, "Oh, well, you know, God, God loves me no matter what. God will love me no matter what I do." Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Right. He hates all workers of iniquity. There are tons of verses in the Bible. Where God talks about hating people. I believe the very next verse. He says again. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. And then he says this. The Lord will abhor. That, that means hate. The, the Lord will abhor the bloody and the deceitful man. Notice again. Does he just choose? Is he just this weirdo Calvinistic type God? No. He hates certain people for specific reasons. He doesn't just say, oh, I just hate you. And I just love, there's something about you. I don't know what it is, but I just love you. And I just hate you. I don't know what it is. No, he's, he's a God of righteousness. And if you're unrighteous, if you cross that line and you just keep getting into wickedness, you reject God, God will hate you. God will hate you. Notice who God hates too. And think about this. In Romans chapter number one, what do they call? Haters of God. You know a bad way for God to start hating you? Is you start hating God. You go down this lifestyle of, of just filth and perversion and just different horrible, just lascivious lifestyle of sin. Just hate God. And then ultimately, you know what might end up happening? God hates you. And you know what's scary about that is it's too late. It's too late for those in Romans chapter number one. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Right, that, that they would destroy themselves, but God loves them. Not only can I turn you to tons of passages where God point blank says, I hate you. I can turn you to passages where God is not being loving to people. Yeah. Think about that for a minute. Where God, God is going to send people to an eternal. I mean, I don't, sometimes we forget about hell. We live in you know, time. You know, think about for a moment what hell is like. Think about this whole building right now. Being immersed in fire, in a lake of fire. You are just immersed from head to bottom, from top to bottom, from head to toe. Immersed in fire. Just burning and burning and burning. For five years, for ten years, for a million years, for a billion years. Are we almost done? No! You're not even close! You can't even put a number on it. We can't even talk about it if you're almost done. If you're almost finished. 
You got another billion years. You got another billion years. You got another billion, zillion, trillion years. It's never going to stop. Do you think God loves the people he's going to send there? Come on. Be rational. Does God want them to go? No, but they cross the line too. God gives them opportunities. He gives them opportunities. He wants them to go to heaven. Right? But then there comes a time when, hey, you've, re you've received too many opportunities. I've given you too many chances. And, you know, people, people just want to have a God that just is a pushover. That just allows them to keep going. Right? It allows them to keep on, uh, on just keep going farther and farther and farther. God has a line where if you cross this line, you're done for. Uh, you're a reprobate. I've rejected you. You're, you, know, you have no hope of salvation. You know what they want to do? They just want to keep pushing God. They want to keep pushing that, that, that marker and that line farther and farther and farther. That's not the God of the Bible. Right. And you know what? If all these churches wouldn't have become so soft and so weak, you wouldn't have a lot of people out here that think that God's like that. Maybe, maybe they actually had, when they were, you know, had, uh, you know, their sanity, and before they had been given over to a reprobate mind, maybe if they understood that God is not a joke, and he's not somebody to be played around with, that maybe they wouldn't have continued down that path. Right. Maybe they would have understood, hey, I actually have an eternal hell that God will send me to, and God will punish me there. I better, you know, I better, you know, submit to this God. There, you know, I better, whatever he wants me to do, wants me to put my faith in him, I better do that. Maybe that would wake some people up if they, when they went to church, if it wasn't just this, you know, you know, where they're just like partying or being sent to the Sunday school or, or children's church or whatever it is for the kids. And there's just, they're just telling them about fun stories the whole time. Maybe if they were hearing about the dreadful and terrible God of which he refers to himself as, maybe that would have kind of woke them up out of that. Maybe if they understood how God actually is and how God actually was in the Old Testament and how he will be in the New Testament and the punishment that he will pour out upon the earth eventually. Maybe if they understood who God actually is, then it wouldn't have been so easy for them to become numb to just whatever lifestyle they want to live. It doesn't matter. You know, maybe that would, you know, maybe they, they wouldn't have been able to help it. When they're trying to avoid, you know, uh, uh, harming their conscience or bo if people bothering them with preaching about the Lord Jesus and the punishment that they deserve, maybe well, they would have just had to listen. Maybe it would have just scared them so much that they would have had to second guess the lifestyle that they were going down. You know, that's we need to hear about the the great and dreadful Lord. We need to hear about the punishments. We need to be preaching all of the Bible. We need to make sure we teach our kid, kids all the Bible. Hey, look at what God did to Edom and Esau. Look at what he did here. Look at, you know, and they need to understand the true reason of why the world was flooded. Why the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. You know what it says right there, I think, in the next verse? Because they were ungodly. You know why God destroyed Edom and Esau? Because they were wicked. Because they were evil. That's why. It wasn't, oh, he already chose what he was going to do to Esau. No, no. God did it because, he's, because they were wicked. Right. And because God is righteous and just and he's not a pushover. Amen. You know what? He loves the righteous. He loves the saved and he loves those that keep his law. But you know what? There are people that God hates. That God hates face the facts. Believe the Bible. Amen. Amen. You know? You, you should know where these verses are. Hey, somebody tells you God loves everybody. Okay. Psalm chapter number 5, verse number 5. Malachi chapter number 1, verse number 2 and 3. Jacob I love, Esau I hate. Oh, it's talking about a whole nation. Oh, so God hates multitudes of people. That's worse than you thought it was a minute ago, right? Think about that. He says that he, he, hate, he hates all the workers of iniquity. There are tons of passages where God talks about abhorring them. How his soul abhors them. Tons of passages. There are multitudes of, of passages. You know what? Even though God will never hate us, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Even though he won't do that. You know what type of attitude you should have? You should still be scared. That same God did this to Edom and Esau. That same God does hate other people. That same God is not a pushover. You know what that still tells you? Yeah, he might not send you to hell, but he could mess your life up here. There's plenty of other examples we could turn to about saved people doing that. That still just shows that God's not a pushover. And he's not a pushover for those that aren't saved. They'll go to hell one day. And he's not even a pushover for those that are saved. They'll never go to hell, but they'll be punished on this earth. Right. They'll, they'll receive, God will take away rewards from them. <clears throat> look, at, uh, 
We'll, we'll complete reading there verse number 4 again. Malachi chapter 1 verse number 4 says, Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. So they have a rebellious attitude here. They said, we're just going to go and build, right? We're just going to go and build. And he says, thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. Look at verse 5. And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. He's saying those in the land of Israel will look at this in the borders of Israel and God and they will, and the Lord will be praised. He will be magnified is what that means in Israel because they're going to look and see the destruction upon Edom or upon the land of Esau and magnify the Lord's name. Notice the punishment that God brings down upon this nation brings praise and honor and glory to God. That's the God of the Bible. Look at verse number six. <clears throat> A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. So he gives an example here. He says, a son honors his father, and a servant his master. If I then be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear, saith the Lord of hosts unto you? O priests that despise my name. And ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? Won't you keep your hand here go over to Matthew chapter number 23. Matthew chapter number 23. Now he makes an interesting statement here. He says, A son honoreth his father and a servant his master. If I then be a father, who do, who's speaking right now? Jehovah, right? The Lord. God is speaking. He says, If I, if, if then I, I'm sorry, if then I be a father, where is mine honor? Notice this. And if I be a master, who do you have speaking? One person, right? You know who it is? Jehovah. It's God. So he says, I'm a father. And then he also says, I'm a master. One person. He says, where is my fear? If I be a master, where is my fear? Look at uh, Matthew chapter number 23. Look at uh, verse number 8. Look at verse number 8. <clears throat> but be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ. So who's the master? Let's qualify this. Jesus is the master, right? He said, it says, But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. Verse number nine. And call no man your father upon the earth. Look at this. For one is your father, which is in heaven. You know what's very interesting is, is the Lord Jesus Christ, while walking on this earth, he says, only call one person your master. Only call one man your master, right? One man. That's actually the key to it. One man. Your master, Christ. And then he says, and only call one your father. And he says, that's your father, which is in heaven. Well, you flip back to Malachi chapter number one, and you find a master and a father both being spoken of in the same verse. And do you know who it is? Jehovah. It's Jehovah. Right. It's Jehovah. Now, What's very interesting about Matthew chapter number 23 is that he says, Call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Okay? Call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. What is the dreadful and terrible, talk about dreadful and terrible, the dreadful and terrible uh, verse for the, uh, for the Trinitarians? What verse? Isaiah 9.6. Isaiah 9, 6, right? And it says, he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, right? The Mighty God, he shall be called what? The Everlasting Father. What is he going to be called one day? What is he going to be called? The Everlasting Father. Amen. What does Jesus Christ say not to call anyone? Father, okay? But then someday, because one is your Father, which is in heaven... But, but the Bible clearly says that we are going to refer to the Lord Jesus Christ as what? The Everlasting Father. Guess what? They only, you only have one Father. Just Amen. like 1 Corinthians 8 says, just like Ephesians 4 says, there's one Father. There's one God, the Father. Amen. Right? The Bible could not be as emphatically, categorically clear. Amen. It's not ambiguous. It's super clear. There's one God, and it's the Father. Period. There's one father, and don't call anyone else your father, except 
there's a prophecy that says the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be called the everlasting Father, but He's not the Father. Are you kidding me? Right. You're a moron. Amen. You're dumb. Amen. You're stupid. Right. Or you're a liar. One of the two. And then you flip back to Malachi one, and it's in the Lord Jehovah speaking, and He says, "I'm your master, and I'm your father." Both. And then Christ says, don't call anybody else your master but me. And don't call anybody else the Father but he which is in heaven. And then John 3, the Son of Man which is in heaven. He's Amen. hanging on the cross and he tells the, the thief that's dying next to him, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Right. Except you got a problem. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jesus goes to hell to pay for the sins of the world. While Jesus is walking on the earth even, he says, the Son of Man which is in heaven. Right? right? And then he says, your Father, well, don't call anyone else Father except the Father which is in heaven. But Jesus Christ is referred to as the everlasting Father. Jesus Christ says when he dies, you're going to be with me in heaven. Jesus Christ says while I'm standing here, the Son of Man which is in heaven. Do you know the only person that is spoken of about being in heaven? All through the Gospels during that time, if we exclude the Son of Man, let's make this very simple. Because there's a lot of simpletons that can't understand this. Do you know the only person? Our Father, which is in heaven. Right? Is it starting to understand? Is it clicking for you? And then what does he say right here? Only call, only call uh, you know, one person Father. Only call one, for one is your Father. Call no man Father upon this earth, for one is your Father, which is in heaven. Which is in heaven. Over and over again. Which is in heaven. Which is in heaven. Which is in heaven. Talking about the Father. And then you have a statement where he says, The Son of Man which is in heaven. And then you have a prophecy that says, Jesus Christ will be called the everlasting Father. And then you have, Jehovah in the Old Testament says that he, one singular person, is master and he's father. Right. And then Jesus says, I'm the master and he's the father. The master is the father, you moron! Amen. It's frustrating! You just want to grab somebody and shake them, man. Seriously, it's annoying! Amen. Believe the stinking Bible! Yeah. And stop trying to say, oh, you know, you know, you know, even if you just exclude these idiots over here that just say, oh, you're a heretic, you're a reprobate, all this re all these retards over here, even there, there's even another group over here that's just still just irrational. That you just present all this information to them. And it's clear they have, they don't have a leg to stand on, but they just write it off. They just, nah. No, it's, it's super clear. He's the everlasting father. I mean, how in the world do you not understand that? Right. But then he says, don't call anybody father. But then, I want to ask these, these, these Trinitarians. I haven't been on this in a while, so I'm staying on it for a few minutes. I want to ask these morons. I want, I want, I want to put them down in the seat. I want, I want to ask them this question, okay? Do you have any problem with calling? I'll talk to them like this. Do you have any problem with calling Jesus the Father? Because you will one day. Right. He's the everlasting Father. Yeah. Right? Do you, do you think, what do you think they'd say? Uh-uh. <coughs> no. No, no, no. Are you kidding me? It says he shall be called the everlasting Father. Then call him. I want you to hear it. I want you to say it. Just tell me right now. Just say Jesus is the Father. Amen. Say it. Look at me in the eye. Say it. Amen. Come on. The Lord is the master. The Lord is the father. There's one Lord. There's not many lords. There's not three lords. There's not two lords. There's one Lord. Amen. One. And the Lord said in the Old Testament, if I be a master, if I be a father, where is my honor? And he said, if I be a master, I don't know the other part of the verse. Where is my fear? He says, where is my fear? If I'm a, if I'm a father, where is my honor? If I'm a master, where is my fear? It, they have these problems, like in Zechariah chapter number 12, where you clearly have one person talking, it's a person dying on the cross, and the person in heaven simultaneously. <coughs> they have a big problem, right? You know what they have going on right here? This is what you'd have to do. A son out of his father and a servant his master. You have the father talking. If then I be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master... Where is my fear? That's the second person. This was the first person. And then the Holy Spirit's just standing back here like this. <laughs> He's never talked about. Right. He's totally avoided all the time. He never speaks. You know, these people are out of their minds. Amen. Right. They are. 
They're out of their minds. They don't want to believe the Bible. Right. That seriously. You know, and I, like I said, I'm not just talking about you know the, the the idiots that are just that just you know you're a reprobate. You just don't have an argument, moron. Yeah, That's right. why I'm just pinning right. you down, and you can't take it. That's what's going on. Because the Bible's clear. But there's also these other people that just want to be kind about it. They want to be nice about it. Well, I just disagree with that. I just, I just disagree with that. You know, this is my point. The Bible's clear. The Bible's clear. But once you see the scriptures, once you see, there are so much, there's multitudes of scriptures. People need to be pinned down about this. Amen. People need to be pushed around about this. Right. You understand what I'm saying? That's my point. It's not just, I'm not going to waste my time talking to these people, but these people over here that are rational, at least to some degree, you know, somewhat, they'll talk to you and they won't, you know, Call you a pedophile and a child molester and like every... I'm pretty sure you're a solid right. I was like, what in the world? You know, I'm talking about a normal person, right? right. That will at least discuss it with you. And they're like, I think you're saved. You're just steeped in heresy, brother. It's like, okay. Are, are you comfortable with calling Jesus the Father? Just pin people down. Take them to Malachi 1 and then let's look over at Matthew 23. Jesus says, that's the Father... And here's the master, right? The Lord Jehovah, one person clearly speaking in the Old Testament said, I'm the master and I'm the father. Right. One. Go back to Matthew or go back to the gospel, the era of the gospel. So you have him say, that's the father in heaven. For what is, for what is your father which is in heaven? And then you have him say, I'm the master. Call, don't call anybody master but me. And then we have a verse over in John 3 that says, the son of man which is in heaven. The Bible's clear is my point. Amen. You can't get around that. Unless you try to create like this other weird system where he's like simultaneously the second person seated in heaven next to the Father. He left heaven, but then he didn't leave heaven. It's like, well, that's kind of what I believe, except they're not two different per you know, not two persons or people, right? It's just the one Lord. And he was born as a man. Man. That's what it is. And you know what? As a man, he was humble. As a man, he stood upon the earth and he honored his father. As a man, he, he worshipped God. As a man, he came and he, you know, he kept all the commandments. He served God. As a man, while he was on this earth, and you know what he said? Don't call anybody father but him which is in heaven. And you know what? Simultaneously, the mystery of God. That same Lord that was on that earth, that same master was seated in heaven, receiving honor from his son. Amen. At the very same moment, at the very same time. You know what you have in Christ? The fullness of the Godhead bodily. Amen. You know what you have? You have master and you have father. Both. Amen. The everlasting father and the master. Both. One. Uh, next verse. Look at verse number... Look, let's look at the end there real quick. So he says, O priest that despise my name, and ye say... Wherein have we despised thy name? Notice they keep doing this where they don't want to take accountability. And they're asking these rhetorical questions. They said it in verse number two. Wherein hast thou loved us? <clears throat> right? It's like, it's like they're, they're kind of dancing around, you know, uh, communicating with God. Wherein hast thou loved us? And then God has to explain himself. And then right here they say, wherein have we despised thy name? So they keep making statements like that. Actually, verse number seven is another one. He says in verse seven, he offer polluted bread upon mine altar... And ye say, wherein have we polluted thee? Notice again, keep how they keep saying this. They keep asking these questions because they don't want to take responsibility for what they've done. God wouldn't be accusing them of this, of course, unless they were doing it. So they say, ye offer polluted bread upon my, mine altar. And ye say, wherein have we polluted thee? In that ye say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. Look at verse number 8. And ye offer the blind for sacrifices. <clears throat> Is it not evil? <clears throat> now, real quick, when it talks about the, the, the bread being polluted, there's only one way in which bread is ever talked about uh, in being polluted, and that is putting leaven in it. They're not supposed to put leaven. It's supposed to be unleavened bread, the bread in specific that the priests were to offer and eat. And uh, we see here that they polluted the bread. So... Comparing scripture to scripture and looking at the only examples of where bread is polluted, it would be, I believe, that they put leaven in it. I believe that that's clear. 
that they're obviously adding leaven, and they are misusing that bread because if you look at the next verse, notice what they did here. And we'll get more into detail on this in just a moment, but it says, and if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. So notice they're offering the blind for a sacrifice. And then he says, is it not evil? And then he says, if, and if you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Now when he says evil there, he's not saying like morally wrong. He's just saying bad like is in bad quality. Like evil oftentimes in the Bible is spoken of as being, it can be like harmful or it can just be like more like our word bad, right? Like the Bible's language, if someone got into like an accident and they were hurt, they would say, the Bible would say, in the Bible's language, that was an evil accident. We would normally say what? That was a bad accident, right? So you can see kind of what I mean by that. It would, it would say that it's harmful. Like God, when he's going to destroy something, you know, it says in Jonah that he repented of the evil that he was going to do, right? He's talking about the harm that he was going to do. God obviously isn't committing something morally wrong. But right here when it says that it's evil, he's saying that it's a bad quality, right? He's saying that it's bad. Like we would look at that and say, like if there's an animal that's just not in good shape, right? Lame. We'd say, man, that's bad, right? It's in bad shape, we would say, right? We say shape, we're talking about the quality of that. And the grade of that would be bad. That's why he says, is it not evil? And then he says, offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person? So he's saying unto your ruler. Right? Uh, you know, someone that rules over you in your area. Would you take it, take this? When he says offer, it's not like saying like you're going to offer this like and burn it as a sacrifice. When they took their offerings and burned it on the Lord, the priest ate it. And oftentimes when the Bible talks about an offering, not you know, unto someone that's not under the Lord. You know, in this type of case, that's not the Lord. It would be like an offering and they were eating it, right? In this case, that's what he's saying. If you were to offer this unto your governor... And, you know, if he were to take it to him and eat it, would he accept thee? Would he accept thy person or would he be pleased with thee? What are they, what is, what's the point? Why would he say this? He's trying to point out that they respect their governor more than they do the Lord. That they respect, you know, human leaders and human, uh, you know, workers more than they do the Lord. Would he accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? And now I pray you, verse number 9. That means I ask. And now I pray you, beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. Beseech means to beg. That he will be gracious unto us. This hath been by your means. Now, two things I want to notice. I want you to notice here. Number one is that, there's, that Malachi is saying, this is Malachi speaking. He says, beseech God that he may be gracious unto us. Notice that God is a God of grace. And God is a God that will respond to us. God is a God that interacts with us not the God of Calvinism. God is a God that you can pray to him and he will choose because of your prayer to show you grace and to show you mercy. We can see that's what Malachi said. Not only that, it says this, this hath been by your means. Now when he says this hath been by your means, he's saying that all this, this punishment that's getting ready to come upon you, it's by your means. He's saying it's your fault. Like your, your means means like your ways. Or, or what you have done. He's saying all this was because of you. Therefore you should pray and ask for forgiveness. The one that did it. The people that did it. Ask for forgiveness. And peradventure God will be gracious to you. Right? He says have been by your means. And he says will he regard your persons? He's saying will he regard your person? Oftentimes persons in the Bible is talking about their race. Or favoritism in social class. Maybe because you're rich or something along those lines. But here they could say. What do the Jews always say? What did John warn the, warn the Jews not to say when he tells them to bring forth fruit meat for repentance? He says, think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. You know, uh, he says, uh, for God is able of these stones to raise up children. For I say to you that God is able of these stones to raise up children under Abraham. So here he says, will he regard, regard your persons? Now this is going to kind of, um, you know, uh, segue us into our next topic here in the next couple of verses. But think about that. Will he regard your persons? Now, what do a lot of, you know, uh, Zionist Jew worshipers say today? That he will. Or they, they believe that the Jews, like, have this just, like, you know, get out of jail free card. It's like an eternal get out of jail free card that they just get to keep. And they get, like, another one every time. Like, they can do whatever they want. And God will regard their persons. That, like, the Jew is, like, above God. Almost. Where God is just like, he can't do anything, his hands are tied, you know, he's not able to do anything to them, right? They can just be wicked, they don't have to believe in him, they already have a covenant, you know, with him. That's what people say. But guess what? 
The, the answer of this question is no. God will not regard your persons. Amen. Don't think to yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. Don't begin to think that, because there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. Keep reading, watch what it says next. Verse 10. Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Now, he's just given an, an example. So pay attention to what he's saying. He's saying, who is there among you that would shut the doors for naught? Like, what type of person would just, like, walk over and open the door and then shut it for no reason? You guys do that often? No, right? No one does. That's, that's the point. No, no one, right? So he says, who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? And then he says this, neither do you kindle fire on my, my altar for naught. He's saying there's a reason why you do it, right? There's a reason why you kindle fire on my altar, and it's to offer something unto God. For it to be pleasing, that's the point, right? The whole pur purpose to offer an offering to God is your offering, I mean, an offering to God, right? Does everyone understand what I'm saying? It's not just a routine or a tradition that they were going through. It's not just something they did because their fathers did it. They did it because God wanted them to do it. They did it for what was the end goal? To please God, right? To, to, to at least, you know, to have something to give to God. Just think about it like that, right? To, to keep the law, to be obedient under the law, which was a figure of things to come, right? Well, no, and that's what he says next. He says, I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts, neither will I accept an offering at your hand. So what's the answer? He's saying, neither do you offer your offerings for naught. And then he says, and I have no pleasure in you. So what are they doing, though? They are offering their offerings, in a sense, for no, for no reason. Because God's not even happy with it. What's the reason you open a door and shut it? Because you walk through the door. There's a purpose for it, right? Well, what's the reason why they offer an offering unto God? For God to be pleased with them, right? To keep God's commandments. But guess what? God says he's not pleased with them. God says he's not happy with them because they're offering it, but then they're not, they're not offering it in the right way, right? They're offering the lame. They're offering the blind, the sick. They're offering that which has a blemish. And there was a purpose to the offering. What was the purpose to the offering? They, may, they you know, I'm sure a lot of them didn't understand it. Probably none of them understood it. But it was meant to actually reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the whole purpose of the offering. And they didn't understand that. I bet you a lot of the saved ones, maybe that like one time they're getting ready to offer it, or you know, I'm sure many of them probably, they just picked out a bad one out of their offering, out of their flock, and they took it. It was a saved guy who you know meant well and a Jew of the Old Testament. And then if you were to come to him and explain to him, like, hey man, you know the reason why you're offering that in the first place is because that, that actually represents the Messiah, which is the Lord in heaven that would come one day and die on the cross, and he's going to be sinless so that he can take all of your sins. So I would go pick another flock. I would go pick something else out of your flock. Don't you think you'd turn around like, and go get another one? Right? Well, do you see why this matters, whether they understood it or not? And, and, and in the first place, let's just say, you know, doesn't God deserve our best in any ways? Doesn't God deserve you to give him your best? You know, we want God to be pleased, so you know what? Don't do something half butt, if you will. Don't do something halfway. You know, you need to give God your all. You need to give God your best, right? Look at what it says next, verse number 11. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And then he says, and in every place, now notice that, and in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, a couple of things that I want to point out about this. Number one, do we have a different person that's speaking now in verse number 11 than we had that was speaking in verse number 6, the master and the father? No. no. But today, if you will, what name is it that all the Gentiles worship God through and in every place? So notice who's speaking, right? The Lord, who is master and father, who is the son of man, right? And the name that all the Gentiles, Jesus was a light unto the Gentiles, right? It, it, you know, it says the name, I can't remember the, exactly how, how it's worded, but it talks about, you know, in him whom the Gentiles trust, right? What's it talking about? It's talking about Jesus. So you know that this is actually fulfilled in Jesus. So the person speaking that says, I'm master and I'm father, is Jesus. Further proof of that. But uh, one, something I want to point out, I just want to go over this real quick. We went over this one other time. But you actually get the definition of Gentiles. Now, people, well, the majority of people have 
this correct, actually, most independent fundamental Baptists, they define Gentiles as the anyone that is not an ethnic Jew. If we're speaking of ethnicity or race, not nation, they're two different things. Ethnicity or race, if you will, in this sense. In this sense actually, I was wrong what I just said. It would be nation. I'm sorry. It would be nation, right? So right here, what, what we have when it says Gentiles, right? Notice what it says. Verse 11. Let's read it one more time together. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles, right? So he says his name is going to be great among the Gentiles. And then he says, continue, and in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering for my name shall be great among what? The heathen. So what does Gentile mean? Yeah. Heathen. He just repeated himself. Uh, heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. Now I want you to turn to Matthew 6.32. Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 32. And Luke chapter number 12, verse number 30. Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 32. And then Luke chapter number 12. Luke chapter number 12. <clears throat> Like I said, I believe it's verse number 30. So you can learn a lot by comparing the Gospels. So I lost my place in Matthew. You can learn a lot by comparing the Gospels to one another. And there will be words that are synonymous. And it can help you understand maybe a difficult word in one book of the Bible. Maybe one of the Gospels, like I said. So Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 32 says, For after all these things do the Gentiles... Seek. So we won't read the whole verse, but he says, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Flip over to Luke chapter 12, verse number 30. Luke chapter 12, verse number 30. This is a parallel. It's actually the same verse, but in the book of Luke, it says, For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. Now notice what the definition here in, in comparing the Gospels of Matthew and Luke Gentiles means nations of the world. When we look in Malachi chapter number one, Gentiles means heathen. So we can get a broader definition from both of these locations in comparing scripture with scripture. Gentiles are the nations of the world. It is those that are not of Israel or those that are not in the nation of Israel. Now in the New Testament, you know, the Bible says, Jesus says very clearly that the kingdom shall be taken from you, speaking unto physical Israel, and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. So it is now a spiritual nation, like it reads in 2 Peter, made up of, you know, uh, made up of every kindred and tongue and nation and tribe, the Bible says, right? And language, I believe, is there as well. That's actually in Revelation. But it's saying everyone. What is it saying? The nations of the world. What is it saying? Right? It would be what's referred to in the Old Testament as the heathen. Now, in, to be in Christ is to be of Israel. The Bible is very clear about that. That the promise was made to one, to the seed, right? The promise was made to the Lord Jesus Christ. And anyone who is in Christ receives that, that promise. Anyone who is in Christ receives or is in that covenant. So the nations of the world is equivalent to the heathen, or is equivalent to, like we saw there, the uh, Gentiles. So people are very confused about what Gentiles means, but it is anyone that is not Israel. Now in the New Testament, you know what who Romans 2 teaches who Gentiles are? It's the same. It's anyone, it, it, in this case, it, you know, if we're speaking in a spiritual sense in the New Testament, Romans chapter number 2 actually teaches that anyone that is not in Christ is a Gentile. And, and you know who it refers to specifically? refers to the Jews. So they are Gentiles. They are what? They are what? The heathen. That's why. Because Gentile means heathen. They are not in Christ. They are not of Israel. They are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Right? Because the promise was given to Jesus Christ. And if they're, they don't have Christ, they're not in Israel. They may think, you know, they have Abraham and their father, but that doesn't mean anything. Notice how this is all over the Old Testament. Seriously. Notice how, it doesn't matter what book we're in. I mean, I could literally... I feel confident that if we were to sit down and you were to give me a few minutes, I could just off the top of my head pull up an example in every single book in the Old Testament 
Uh, I mean, Obadiah would be pretty hard, maybe some like books with like only a few verses. But I feel confident that the majority of the books in the Old Testament, I could just give you examples of salvations of the Gentiles or prophecies and promises that the Gentiles would be saved. I mean, we, we look through the book of Ruth, and it's about a woman who is a Moabite. And she is, she is one of the progenitors of the Lord Jesus Christ. And people, I don't know how, they have to just not be reading their Bibles. You know, all of these Zionists, all of these people, I'm not trying to preach about this all the time. I'm not looking like, hey, I just want to preach against the Jews. I just want to preach. I, and I'm not even preaching against the Jews. They, you know, this is exactly how, even they're, they're brainwashing me. I feel like I'm being anti-Semitic, but I'm not. I'm being fair. I'm saying you have to be in Christ. Amen. It's working on me. They're manipulating me. I'm not preaching against them, actually. I'm just saying that God is fair. God is not a respecter of persons like this. Will he respect your person? What's the answer? No. He will not respect your person. And then what does he say right after that? What does he say right after that? He says, my, great, my name will be great among the Gentiles. It says, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. He said, incense and offerings will be offered unto me in every place. What does he mean by every place? Why does he say that? He's saying all over the world. Nations of the world. Right? And then he says that his name will be dreadful. I think it says, that, no, it says again, great. It shall be great among the heathen. I can turn you to Genesis. I got a good example for you in Genesis. I got two good examples for you. Maybe Abraham. How's that sound? Because he was circumcised. Or he, was, he received the covenant before he was circumcised, Romans 4. You know what? That's really one of the things that actually take, made you a Jew in the Old Testament. Because it brought you into the nation. Many became Jews. What do you think they did? Right? That, that meant it was being a nation. It wasn't an ethnic group. It was a part of that nation, per se. It was part of, it was being in the nation, not per se, exactly. It was being in the nation, not where you descended from. And Abraham, when he was saved, wasn't a Jew for a little while. He wasn't, Jew and circumcised are used interchangeably all in the New Testament, over and over and over again. Especially the book of Romans. So Abraham, when he got saved, your father wasn't even a Jew in the beginning. He wasn't even circumcised. I got another one for you, Joseph. This is just the first book of the Bible. He married an Egyptian woman. I got another one for you. The book of Exodus. Moses, he married an Egyptian woman. He married a, a Midianite. She was an Ethiopian. He, uh, the first one. He married a, a Midianite. I mean, we could do this. You know, we, the, we got the book of Zechariah. I mean, I could take you to Joel, prom, the promise of whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know what that means? Whosoever. Do you know where it's quoting? I was going to turn to you there anyways. Go to Romans. Let's look at this. In Romans. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. I don't know if I actually pointed this out when we went through Romans chapter number 10, but what does whosoever mean? If it was only offered to a certain nation or a certain group of people, could you say whosoever? You couldn't, but it says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, right? He's trying to make a point. Look at the verse right before it. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You notice that? Over and over and over again. Look at the very end of, of Romans chapter number 10 while we're here. Verse number 18. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? So first he asks about the heathen or the nations. Don't they know the gospel? It says, yes, they know the gospel. The sound went out to the end of the world. They heard all of it, right? Look at verse 19. But I say, did not Israel know? So didn't Israel, the Old Testament, didn't they know that the Gentiles would, would, uh, would also be fellow heirs? And then it says, first Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. And by a foolish nation will I anger you. So not only do you have Moses himself marrying an Ethiopian woman and a Midianite, he prophesied of the Gentiles being fellow heirs, Right? He prophesied of that even taking place in the future. And then he says, but Isaiah is very bold. So he preached about this even harder is what it's saying. And saith, I found of them, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. Notice that. But to Israel, he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. He asked the question, did Israel, did Israel know? And what is, and what is the response? Well, they should have. It was prophesied all throughout the Old Testament 
of the covenant changed. But even in the Old Testament, you have examples of people being saved. You got Naaman, the Syrian. You got tons of examples of people getting saved, of calling upon the name of the Lord. You have people, you know, even at the end of the book of Esther, who became Jews, even in the nationality. And I'm, I'm sure that they preached unto them the gospel. They told them that the Messiah was coming, that you have to put your faith in, in God. You have to, because that's, that's what before. The revelations of the Messiah, like we spoke about this the other day, all the extensive revelations of the Messiah, what do you have Abraham doing? He just believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Now, what did he believe specifically? The New Testament tells you the gospel. Right? So they would, they would preach unto them the gospel, the good news, that the Messiah would come or that there would be a seed, let's just say, would come and would reign and rule one day and would conquer death, conquer the serpent, is the promise given in Genesis 3. Right? And they would believe in that. And then they would they can inherit in any tribe that they want, the law says. People conveniently look over that. I'm not trying to set, pick these books because I want to preach these subjects. They're everywhere. The book of Ruth is about a Moabitess. You have here in the very first chapter of Malachi, you have God saying that his name will be great among the Gentiles. Among the heathen, his name will be great. Look at the next verse, Malachi chapter 1, verse 12. But ye have profaned it, saying, You profaned my name. In that ye say, The table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible. Now, contemptible just means to be like base, where it means to be like, it's like, uh, like you look down upon. It's like in a courtroom when the judge says that they have them in contempt, or they're holding them in contempt. He's saying like, you're contemptible in my sight. That's what that means, like you're base in my sight, right? That's actually what that means. If you look up contempt or contemptible, it means that you're looking detestable. That's a definition of, of contemptible. It means like to look down, almost like to hate something or, you know, to have a strong dislike. It, actually, I think there's a definition. I don't remember where it's at. I think it's in, in Malachi chapter 2. Contemptible is used in uh, Malachi chapter number 2. And he actually uses interchangeable with base. We'll get to that later. But contemptible just means to be base. If you look up the word contemptible in the Bible. Look at verse 13. He said also, behold, what a weariness is it. And ye have snuffed at it. Snuffed is like quenched. Ye have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts. And ye brought that which is torn. And the lame and the sick. Thus ye brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? Now notice he says you snuffed at it, right? And what did he say just a minute ago? That they were offering their offerings for nothing, right? He says, Do you, does one open a door and shut it for nothing, right? Now he's, And then he said right after that, you're, are you offering the offerings for nothing? Now he says, after that, again, he says, he snuffed at my offering. What does it mean to snuff? It means to quench something, right? It means to, to, to uh, get rid of it. He's saying that they're basically, you're all, again, he's saying the same thing. You're offering my offerings for nothing. You're making them nothing. They're pointless is the point. They're, they, basically, they're doing away with the offerings. Why? Because they're doing it for no reason. The, the purpose or the point of the offering is gone. Therefore, they're not even really offering it. God doesn't even look at it like they're offering it. They've snuffed it out, right? It's gone is the point. That's why he says they're offering it for no reason because the point is to satisfy God, right? Because it is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says this, And you brought that which was torn and the lame and the sick, Thus she brought an offering, should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord. Just for information purposes, I'm not going to turn there, but De Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 19 through 21, and Deuteronomy 15, 19 through 21, actually explain to you the stipulations of the offering and, what, and how it is supposed to be without blemish, and you're supposed to pick a male of the flock that is not lame, that is not sick, that is not, you know, uh, doesn't have any blemishes. It's supposed to be perfect or complete. And then he says, uh, uh, there at the end, should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord, verse 14? But cursed be the deceiver which hath in his flock a male and voweth and sacrificeth unto the Lord a corrupt thing. So notice what this guy is doing. This guy is a deceiver. God is saying, curse you. Saying he has a male in his flock. He has something good. But what does he do? He doesn't give that one. He goes and finds something sick. And something ill, something that's lame. Can, lame means it can't walk or it's blind, right? It's got some kind of defect. It's got problems. And that's why they give to the Lord. Why do they do that? Because they want to keep the other one to eat it. Because that's their food, right? The lambs, that's what they would eat. 
The, they would use the lamb. They got. They would do other things with with sheep. They would. They would make clothing from the sheep. Right. There's multiple things. You know, if you look around in different cultures, they'll. They'll. I mean, they'll like make use of the hooves. They'll make use of everything on those animals. Especially then when that's like you know they were they were herdsmen. Right. That's their main uh, you know occupation. So I'm sure they knew that well. That's important to them. But you know what should be more important? God. You know what should be the most important thing is giving. The whole point of offering that offering is that you need to take the best one because God deserves the best. Amen. And you know what happens in the end? People that don't want to tithe, people that don't want to sacrifice to God, God's in, God ends up cursing you anyways. God, what does he say right there? But cursed be the deceiver which hath in his flock a male. What is God doing to this person? They think like, you know what? I'm going to just hold back the best. I'm not going to give everything that I should give. And then what do they do? They just give a little, you know, it's just, it, it would be compatible to a person that just doesn't tithe all their money, doesn't give what they're supposed to give. They only give like 8% because they need a little bit extra for a certain period of time. And they're like, I'm just going to hold that back and I'm going to use that later. But do you know what happens? There's a God that runs this universe and he's the one that gave you that command in the first place. You're doing it for naught. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're doing it for no reason because God wants you to do it to be pleasing unto him. God wants you to do it to keep his commandments. God wants you to do it because that's what you're supposed to do. So you know what's going to happen? I'm going to put that money away for a rainy day, just for, just for a couple months we're saving or something. We're just not going to do that for a while. And then what ends up happening? You end up having less money. It's like, you know, then your whatever, your car breaks down. Then you've got to fork up that, you know, other 2% that you kept and fix your car. Then something, and then you end up being in, in the negative. Why? Because you didn't give what you're supposed to give in the first place. Because, because that see, that's what it's all about. It's about faith. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Like, if you think that it's just like, oh, it's routine. I'm just here to give my ten percent, right? We just this is just what I should do. If that if that's in your mind that you're not keeping God in mind, if you love me, keep my commandments, like the Lord said. If that's not what you're keeping in mind, you just come in here and you're not even thinking about God, you may make a decision like that. If you're not living by faith, if it's just routine, you're living in the flesh, and you're just, well, what's going to be the best? You know what you're doing when you're rationalizing things like that? You're not living by faith. When you're thinking, oh, you know, I need to just put this little bit of money away because you're not living by faith. You're not believing that when God says give 10%, it'll still work out. You're not believing, you know what you're thinking, well, it's a perfect example of Proverbs 3.5. Lean not upon thine own understanding. Because you're trying to lean upon your own understanding. It says, trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not upon thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Right? So what you're doing is you're saying, well, I'm just going to put this money aside. Or I'm going to do this on the side. Whatever it may be. Right? I'm just going to, I'm not going to sacrifice this time. I'm not going to keep that commandment. It doesn't have to be money. Right? It could be any commandment. And then you just say, well, I'm not going to do that this time. But I'll do it later. Or I don't have time to do that. I don't have time to do a soul money soul winning for a few weeks for this reason, but I'll do that later. I don't have time to do whatever it may be, right? But then what happens is God ends up cursing you. What happens is you, you end up, you know, you end up being in the negative. You think, well, I'm going to make up this time for this reason, or I'm going to make up this money for this reason, or I'm going to do this and this reason, and then what does he say? But cursed be the deceiver, which hath in his flock a male, and boweth and sacrificeth unto the Lord a corrupt thing. What does he not get? He doesn't get the best. He doesn't get the full 10%. He doesn't get the full time. He doesn't get the full investment. He doesn't get you reading your Bible every day. He doesn't get the commandments that you're supposed to keep. He doesn't get all the things that we're supposed to do as Christians keeping the Lord's commandments. Why? Because we're not doing it. We shouldn't be doing it for naught. The ultimate goal is to do what? Please, God. Amen. If you love me, keep my commandments. Right. It's not just, oh, you know, I just, I just keep my commandments, God's commandments, because that's just what I'm supposed to do. Just, I just, my parents did it, so I do it. That's what they were doing, I'm sure. It's just tradition, right? It, they're, they're, they don't even, it's almost like they're clueless. It's not only that, it could possibly, not that they're not taking responsibility, which it probably is, but it could be, because people are like this in some cases, where they're just like, you know what? I'm not even sure what I did because you know I've just been doing this forever and this is just what my parents taught me to do. You understand what I'm saying? They're not doing it for the right reasons, therefore they're just clueless about it, right? It could be that as well. So we need to make sure we're serving God, we're giving God our best. 
We're giving God, we're doing the commandments because that's what we're supposed to do. We're, do, we're keeping God's commandments because we love God and we want to please him. Amen. It's not for us. It's not, you know, for show. It's not for, you know, because this is just what's best for me. It's for God. You know, it ultimately should be all for God. That's what it should be about. Amen. It shouldn't be, I don't know why it's popping in my mind. I want to do something big with my life. It should be, I want to do something big for God. Amen. Really, seriously. Right. You know, it should be about God. That's, this whole, that's what he's talking about here. They're offering the offering, and, and they're doing everything. But you know, you know the one thing that, that, that they're not doing, right, is they're not giving the best. You understand what I'm saying? They're giving something that they, that they don't want to even. Maybe that, maybe that they would have used, but they're like, I still want to keep. It's not that they're not at all keeping God's commandments. People are probably like, I still want to keep God's commandments, but it's just not convenient for me to give the best out of my life. It'd be way better because I got a friend coming over and that lamb would be perfect, right? Or, you know, that's a big lamb and I could eat off that thing for a while. How about this lamb? Think about that. This would be better. That's, you, you realize these are real people. This really happened. People do the exact same thing. Today. You may not have, you know, a flock of lamb in, in your back yard or something, right? But you have something of value that God wants you to give. And I didn't, wasn't doing money when I did this. I was just, a, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Let's pass that offering plate around for you, leave. right? No, you have something of value. I was actually thinking time was the most important thing, really. Because what, what, that's the most important thing to God because what is it? It's reading your Bible. It's, you know, most of the time when people don't read their Bibles because they, they do something else. It's not normally, you know, yeah, you can be, it can be partially lazy, but it's normally, you're not, you don't normally just go lay down. I mean, I don't think most people do that, right? When you don't read your Bible, you go do something else. Because you're like, well, I'll invest a little bit of time, but I'm not going to finish my Bible reading. You know, that sounds familiar. I'll do this, you know, I'll do, you know, I'll give this amount of money or I won't do that. Hey, I'll go sorting this week, but I won't go next week. It can, you know, it's the time. That's the most important thing to God. That's the most important thing. You know what we need to do? We need to keep God's commandments from the heart. Amen. We should keep them anyway, even if you're going to do it by routine. Hey, if that's all that you're going to do, just keep the commandments at least, right? But you know what? We should be keeping them from the heart and we should be giving God the best that we have. So we'll read out the rest of the verse there. It says, And sacrificeth unto the Lord a corrupt thing. There after the colon in the middle of verse 14, it says, For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts. Those are great words right there. I am a great king. You know, he's talking the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That's right. You know, speaking, it's that same person that walked on this earth and said, the son of man, which is, he is in heaven. Amen. You know, that's, it becomes much sweeter to you and much greater to you. And you look at Jesus so much more wonderfully. And he means so much more to you when you realize that the same God of the Old Testament that said, for I am a great king, was the same God who was hanging on the cross and said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's powerful, man. Amen. That makes me tear up. That's powerful. Think about that. I am a great king. That same God it was willing to come down to this earth. Willing to humble himself. Willing to have a God, right? Which was, of course, himself. It's a great mystery. It's not a separate God, like these Trinitarians would say. It's not God the Father, God the Son. The same God came down to this earth. That same God that said in the Old Testament, For I am a great king. That's powerful. Amen. For I am a great king. What does that mean? He's a great king. Not just a normal king. Maybe it's the king of kings. Maybe it's the lord of lords. Maybe it's the guy that has that written on his thigh when he comes back in Revelation 19. Look at what it says next. Saith the Lord of hosts. And then he says this. And my name, look at this, is dreadful among the heathens. This is a theme that we can see carried out through Malachi chapter number 1. In conclusion, what did we start with? God saying, Jacob have I loved... Esau have I hated. Think about that. Jacob have I loved. Esau have I hated. And then he ends by saying that his name is dreadful. You know, God is someone to fear. God is not a joke. God is not someone that we should just, you know what? We should be scared not to give 
all of our time, not to go soul winning, not to just keep all of our, his commandments, not to read our Bibles, not to give all, all to God, not to, you know, anything for the church or anything that you could do, period. You should be scared not to do that. Why? Because you saw what he did to Esau and Edom, Edom, right? Why else? Because he is dreadful. God is dreadful. He is a great king. You know, I'm glad that my God is a great king. Amen. I'm glad that he's not just a normal king, right? right. When, you, it, when you read about the God of the Bible, and then you hear these fairy tales about all these other religions, you know what you end up saying at the end? My God's a great king. That's right. He's not like these other gods. Amen. You know, he's not like the God of, the, of, of uh, Buddhism or the God of all these other religions. The God of the Bible is not just, you know, just some normal God. He is the one and only true God. He is the great king. And he should be dreadful. We should be, what does that mean, dreadful? I'm not saying that he is full of dread, but he fills us with dread. His name is dreadful to us. It causes us to be full or filled with dread. We should be scared of God. There should be a healthy fear of God. You shouldn't fear man. You should rather fear God or the Lord, who's able to destroy both soul and body and hell. Notice that's an example. Think about that. I'm going to close on this point right here that just popped in my mind. Notice a moment ago that I said we should fear the Lord that destroyed Esau and Edom because he's not just this God that just loves everyone. He hates people. He will never hate us, but that still shouldn't still fear in you. Well, you know what? God will never send you to hell either. But you know, he made the statement that you shouldn't fear man, but you should rather fear, fear God who is able to destroy both soul and body and hell. He's not going to send you to hell, but that's a dreadful God. That's a great king. That's someone to be feared. Right? So we should fear God. Therefore, we should offer the best unto him. And that God, we need to know who that God is. We need to have a good understanding of it. The Master and the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow ahead and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for Malachi chapter number one, dear Lord. We thank you for the Bible, how amazing and great it is, dear Lord. We ask you that you would bless us, be with us, keep us safe, dear Heavenly Father. Help us to honor you as our Father and help us to fear you, dear Lord, as our Master, dear Lord. And that we would understand that you are dreadful, dear God, and that you're not a joke, that you're a strong God, that, we, that uh, you deserve fear and you deserve honor, dear Lord. Uh, we love you so much. Just please be with us. Help us stand for the truth. We ask you. Dear God, that we would help our church to grow and that we would have a mighty impact in Jacksonville. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.